Good afternoon. Welcome. I open hearing number four of the 184th regular period of sessions of the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights, which is titled The Situation of Rights of LGBTIQ plus Children and Families in Ecuador, which was requested by the Foundation Pacta, the legal clinics of the San Francisco de Quito, de Quito University, the Institute for Research on Equality, Gender and Rights, INIHED, the Amor and Fortaleza Foundation, the Dialogo Diverso Foundation, and the Network of LGBTIQ Litigators of the Americas. My name is Estuardo Rallon, the first vice president of the commission and rapporteur for Ecuador. Today, we have this we have here the second vice president commissioner, Margaret May, my colleague, also commissioner Esmeralda Arasamela de Troitinho, rapporteur for children and adolescents, and commissioner Roberta Clark, rapporteur for LGBTIQ persons. We also have with us today the special rapporteur for uh, Redesca Soledad Garcia Munoz and secretary Maria Claudia Pulido. So let me first greet the representatives of the state and all persons present here today on behalf of the civil society. First, let me explain to you how the time will work. We will first allocate 20 minutes for the petitioners. Then the state will also have 20 minutes to intervene. Then we will have comments and questions on, on the part of the uh, commission for 20 minutes. We will give the floor back to the petitioners for 12 minutes, the state for 12 minutes, and we will conclude for six minutes. On the screen, you will be able to see a clock that will keep track of time of each of the interventions. So without any further ado, I give the floor for 20 minutes to the petitioners. Good afternoon, honorable commissioners and representatives of the state. I am Karen Anaya of the LGBTI Litigants Network of the Americans, and together with the petitioning organizations, we want to present to you the situation of trans and intersex children and LGBTI plus families in the country. We consider that this hearing will contribute to make the visible situation of discrimination that is pending in the region as evidence in the hearing at the 175th period of session of the commission in March, 2020 on the population of LGBTIQ persons in the Americas. Also, it is vital to stop approaching these issues from the adulterous centrism approach that governs thinking of the majority, leaving aside the life experiences and struggles of different girls, boys, and children. So the idea is to propose solutions to join efforts between the civil society, the state, and the commission. We will begin by presenting a video then. <laughs> Amada was the first trans girl that managed to change her ID card with her name and her gender identity. The family of Amada initiated a judicial process so that the state would recognize her identity. When us with our with my parents wanted to change my name on my identity card the persons at the registry office told us that i did not have the same rights as other persons for just being a transgender girl however after uh, an appeal amada's identity card was again uh, holding the male data. In the educational system, trans children suffer violations to their rights. In 2017, Clara, a trans girl who at the time was five years old, experienced violence at her school. So they refused us because they alleged that 
since the identity card did not say that she was a female or she had another name, she had to use the bathroom for boys and she was not allowed to have long hair. Since uh, all day the girl was at the at school, did not went to the bathroom, did not go to the bathroom, and sometimes she urinated herself. And as regards the clothes during the Olympics of that year, she was forced to go to the to the queue of boys because there was a queue for girls and a queue for boys and she was forced to go to the boys queue in 2018 the institution constitutional court demanded mechanisms to recognize children of same-sex couples But in, 19, in 2019, a group of women had to initiate a legal process to uh, register her, their daughter. The couple took two years to register their daughter because the registry office refused to do so. And the sentence was in favor for the couple. During the process, there were some delays. Testimonio de la familia de Amada. So this is the testimony of Amada's family. Good afternoon. My, no my name is Lorena Bonilla, and I'm here with my, my husband, Mauricio Caviedes. Our daughter made her transition at the age of six and six months. With all the family support, there were difficult moments with psychologists, and we went through 14 schools until we got education for my daughter. From the age of eight, we started meetings with lawyers, and finally at eight, at nine years old, after causing all the cities so that she could be evaluated by experts, we got her documents with a feminine name. After the civil registry appealed to this decision, we went to the provincial court where my daughter asked to be heard and attended, but she was never taken into account by the state. The provision court decision came, and from that moment, my daughter's male name became visible again in the health and education systems. In the school, they asked us to have two private meetings in which they require my daughter's birth certificate to verify the incongruence between our birth certificate and the data they had from the civil registry. How do I explain this to my daughter after everything we went through? After years of fighting in courts, in writings, in media and marches, we were back to square one again. The Ministry of Health and the Education, Ecuadorian Institute of Social Security, in spite of all the work meetings and conversations, passed responsibility from one official to another, and there was a lack of a regulation that would grant access to puberty blockers for Amada. There were no possible access to health, and everything was left to a political decision. We needed urgent solutions. We were financially uh, broken. I quit my job and my husband got a job out of town and away from the family to, to have some income to continue with our struggle. But psychologically and morally, we were drained. Our mental health was already compromised. That was when we decided to migrate to Canada. Taking my daughter out of the country led us again to this uncomfortable situation of explaining the immigration officials that my daughter is not in their records. We cannot return back to Ecuador to visit our relatives because we have, we're have. we not certain that we will be able to take her out of the country again. Permanent residency in Canada can also be hindered by the lack of updated documents. The parents of the foundation with whom we are still in contact are aware of the situation and hope that this fight will not stop because there are many trans children waiting for their situations to be solved. Without answers, the Ecuadorian state definitely forced us to look solutions outside of the country since 1920. Our case is at the Constitutional Court waiting for a resolution that will surely take years. We believe that the government, through its ministry and officials, pushed us to this difficult decision to migrate. Situation of intersex and trans girls. Good morning, I'm Mateo, and I will address the legal 
considerations and framework for trans girls in Ecuador. The state of Ecuador, in spite of being contained by the Inter-American Court for Institutional Homophobia in case Flor Freire against Ecuador continues to not observe its obligations to as a guarantee equality to equal access to rights for LGBTQ plus persons. The Inter-American Court in its um, advisory opinion 2417 establishes that the changes of gender identity in official documents for intersex and trans children are part of the right to gender identity. In Ecuador, there is no law that guarantees this right. The cases of Amanda Clara show that trans children are not a priority for the state of Ecuador, who does not recognize their rights to self-determination and forces them to wait five years for a constitutional res resolution that is still not there. The legislative power in Ecuador also is another barrier for the trans and intersex population, especially for children. This power taken into consideration uh, by mandate of the Constitutional Court containing the ruling Caso Bruno Paolo is forced to reform discriminatory mechanisms that prevent sex change. However, they are not implementing this uh, sentence or ruling. They have not, uh, they are working also to reform the code for children, uh, but the reform does not cover the existence of intersex of intersex children and does not consider the or prohibits genital mutilation. It denies the possibility of sex or gender change in trans children and also does not prohibit clinics or therapies of dehomosexualization of children. Trans and intersex children cannot be uh, ignored anymore. They should be a state priority. Good morning. I am Bernanda Freire from Pacto Foundation, recognizing, guaranteeing, and protecting all the rights that derive from a family relationship between same sex people is one of the main recognitions of the advisory opinion 2417, which is recognized in Ecuador in litigation cases also in the constitution and infra-constitutional norms. However, there are many difficulties in the exercise of these rights for LGBTI plus people. In case Satya, um, according to jurisprudence, public officials in charge of uh, recording um, birth certificates cannot indicate that there is a lack of legislation uh, to uh, not acknowledge the rights to identity, equality, and non-discrimination of children. Also, the National Assembly, within a year's deadline after the ruling, that is, since 20, uh, May 2018, should adopt the necessary provisions to regulate uh, assisted reproduction medical procedures according to constitutional provisions, but that order has not been complied with. And the Office of Vital Records continues to have protocols that violate human rights. And this includes the cases of Elena and these who have taken their cases to justice in order to be able to record their daughter. They had a daughter through artisanal insemination procedures. Um, they are legally married. However, since they did not have their certificate of the assisted reproduction um, center, they were not able to record their or uh, their daughter. The same happened to Belena Daniel, a family from which uh, whose rights have been not recognized several times by the state of Ecuador. They have not been able to record their son and they have to take this case to court. The omission of legislating of the National Assembly of Ecuador has only damaged the situation of gay men and trans couples because they have no possibility of exercising their right to be parents. Also, this makes us conclude that the filiation of boys, girls, and adolescents of LGBTI couples is not a full right. 
Therefore, it's necessary that the state of Ecuador adopts the necessary measures to comply with its current international oblig obligations. Since the state nor its administration has not prevented the Office of Vital Records from violating the rights to so identity and violation uh, for LGBTI populations and their children. Good afternoon. My name is Gabriela Flores, and I'm also a member of uh, one of the clinics. In spite of the fact that the Constitution of Ecuador recognizes that the right to a family and prohibits discrimination, the adoption, uh, according to the Constitution, adoption is only for couples from different sexes. This provision violates the rights of pers LGBTI persons and also of children in Ecuador. Taking into consideration diverse families, the situation is very serious. Adoption is the only way to have children for them. The Ecuadorian norms prevent them from having this opportunity of having children. Many of these people cannot be parents or adopt a children de facto, or they are just single parents. Also, this provision violates the rights of children in Ecuador because it is a system of adoption that lacks adopting families, and the state decides to exclude LGBTIQ plus couples who could transform or change the lives of several children. For many of these reasons, we believe that this constitutional provision is unconventional. With regard to LGBTIQ plus persons, there are three rights that should be considered, equality, family, and private life. Regarding equality and discrimination, as the Inter-American Court said in several of its rulings, the notion of equality is, is inconsistent with any situation that discriminates the enjoyment of rights to a group of people. Also, a group that is victim of structural discrimination is excluded from the possibility of adopting a child because of their sexual preferences. This is not the situation of heterosexual couples that do have the right to adopt. Also, this position is discriminatory. Also, we see that in other rulings, for example, in Chile, same-sex marriages are or had the right to adopt a children. Secondly, with regard to the right to family and private life of LGBTIQ plus persons, we see that the Inter-American Commission indicates that the convention does not impose a single concept of family. And therefore, it protects Article 17 of the American Convention, that is life in family. A this a provision that we are presenting today goes against all these criteria and does not allow LGBTI persons to be parents. In addition, the advisory opinion 24-7 has indicated that private life covers all these spheres of intimacy and autonomy of a person, including their personal and family relations, which are threatened by this constitutional provision. In addition, LGBTI persons are not the only ones affected. Children are also affected. In this second part of my analysis, I would like to present you some additional figures regarding adoptions in Ecuador. They, these figures were published by the Ministry of Economic Inclusion and Social Inclusion. In 2021, 308 children were, could be adopted against seven, but only 74 only 77 families were qualified to adopt children. As a result, 223 children were left without a family. So until April this year, 250 children could be adopted, but only 24 families were allowed to adopt a child. This happened this year. Also, as recognized by the Constitutional Court, children deprived of a family nucleus Adoption sometimes is an exception, and institutionalization is the rule. And also, we see that all this situation 
has to do with this constitutional provision that excludes LGBTI persons from the possibility of adopting a child. The Convention on the Rights of the Child recognizes a right to family for children, and therefore states are obliged to protect children who are homeless or who, have not, who do not have a family and should offer them the guarantee to access a family. On the contrary, the constitutional provision shows that the state prefers that children are just left in a home without a family instead of having an LGBTIQ plus family. This is unacceptable in a country that adoption is allowed for, uh, in countries where adoption is allowed for same-sex couples, uh, we see that adoption, that these couples are eager to adopt even more than heterosexual families. Also, we need to have mechanisms that reivindicate rights of all and everyone. Final conclusions. Finally, taking into consideration what we mentioned before, we would like to present the following requests. First, to the state of Ecuador, the National Assembly should build a norm to promote uh, diverse families and LGBTIQ plus families taking into consideration the ruling of the Constitutional Court and the advisory opinion 2417. Also, the Constitutional Court of Ecuador should prioritize the resolution of cases of trans children and homoparental families, especially the cases of Amanda and Clara. Also, the Secretary of Human Rights should comply with the creation of a LGBTQI plus public policy as ordered in 2015, that the Office of Vital Records adapts its actions to the criteria of equality and non-discrimination and to stop not complying with the rulings of Constitutional Court and Advisory Opinion 2417. Also, Article 68 of the Constitution that restricts adoption for uh, homoparental families. To conclude, we request the Honorable Inter-American Commission of Human Rights first to uh, send an advisory opinion to the court regarding the restrictions to legal access and constitutional actions to the right of affiliation and adoption of children by LGBTIQ plus families. Also, uh, we request a thematic report on the situation of LGBTIQ plus children and their family context in the America, and also uh, the state of Ecuador should apply a program through the PUCA program to receive technical assistance to improve procedures regarding the recognition of gender identity and the records of affiliation of um, LGBTI children and their families. Thank you so much. We will continue now with the hearing, and we would like now to give the floor to the state for 20 minutes. Thank you. Can you hear me well? Thank you. Good afternoon uh, to the chair of this hearing and commissioner for Ecuador, and I also would like to greet all the distinguished commissioners that are with us here today. We would like to thank you for your interest in this relevant issue in the society of Ecuador that has led to many debate and that is related to the implementation of several public policies. We also would like to greet all the representatives of civil society and human rights organizations that are here today with us. Um, who have presented today. We have recorded what they have indicated during their presentation. With regard to the information presented, presented by civil society, I would like to introduce now uh, the members of my government. First, we have the Secretary of Human Rights, um, represented by Alexandra Iwana that is Secretary of Diversity, together with Rodrigo Maria Torres, who is an advisor of the Secretary of Human Rights. On behalf of the Office of the General Attorney, we have um, 
uh, some members here. We also have uh, a member of the ministry, the Minister of Human Mobility, and on behalf of the foreign um, of the permanent mission, uh, we have some members as well today. And after introducing some of the delegates of the government of Ecuador, I would like to give the floor to Alexander Guano, that is Secretary of Diversity, who will be presenting first on behalf of the Ecuadorian delegation. Thank you so much. Thank you. Good afternoon to the Inter-American Commission of Human Rights. I would like to greet the representatives of civil society organizations. And on behalf of the state of Ecuador, we would like to thank for this space of dialogue to make uh, the specific needs of the LGBTQI plus population visible. Um, we are here to discuss also the situation of the rights of children and LGBTI persons and families in Ecuador. I would like now to share our answer regarding uh, presentation made by the civil society and we would like to respond in two ways first we as a representative of the secretariat of human rights that represent executive branch of the executive or uh, of the government we have created the first unit to address um the needs of lgbtqi plus persons um, the current administration through executive degree, decree 93 from July 2021 amplify the capacity of the Secretariat of Human Rights to promote the eradication of any forms of violence and discrimination based on sexual orientation or sexual diversity. And it established a deadline of six months to adjust its structure and implement this a specific administrative unit within the state of Ecuador. This is within the executive branch. This is a preparation measure with regard to the rights of LGBTI plus persons. In addition, through Decree 216 of October 2021, the specific role of the Secretariat of Human Rights were established in terms of the eradication of all forms of violence and discrimination based on sexual orientation of sexual diversity. And this made emphasis on the creation of public policies, plans and projects to benefit the LG, LGQ, um, the LGQTV, uh, LGBTQI population. Also, we work together with the institutionalization of the Secretariat of Diversities as of November 2021. This under Secretariat of Diversity was made operational through two executive directions, the direction of integral policies on the rights of LGBTIQ plus population and also the direction of promotion and monitoring to eradicate violence against this population. As main lines of action within um, the, and taking into consideration the activities that we are executing as, as part of the Undersecretariat of Diversity, we are working on the action plan on diversity between 2022 and 2025. So the plan will last until 2025. And the plan is the first tool of public policy aimed at this population for the first time in Ecuador. This diversity action plan was executed and financed through international cooperation through the International Organization for Migration of the United Nations. There was an advisor, a consultant hired by the IOM and is working together with the Undersecretariat of Diversity. This plan had, had four stages, a diagnosis phase to establish 
uh, the, or to identify the official data that exists regarding this population in Ecuador. We conducted, conducted a case study, or there is a case study from 2013 regarding the situation of the LGBTIQ plus population. And also we supplemented this diagnosis together with other technical studies conducted by civil society because they are the ones who have worked in order to promote the rights of this population. There is a second phase in this plan that is the national dialogue in order to guarantee a participatory process in order to develop this plan and these policies that include public policies. And we included in this second phase 170 17 participants from 84 civil society organizations. Those participants were identified in different cities where most of civil society organizations were located. We had three forums, one in Guayaquil, one in Quito, one in Cuenca, and we have bilateral meetings in the cities of Machala, Lojo, and Puerto Viejo. In the city of Loja, the first provincial table on the rights of LGBTIQ plus population was held. This is how we built this uh, plan on diversity. The third phase had to do with the design of the specific actions. And we held an inst institutional table that includes 28 state institutions. They uh, are related to several powers within the state. Usually uh, most of the institutions belong to the executive branch, but there are some other institutions who belong to the judiciary and there are a couple of institutions that are within the legislative branch. And in this regard right now, we are working in the fourth phase of the plan that has to do with interinstitutional validation of all the actions uh, to which state institutions have committed. Um, this is within the areas of expertise and taking into consideration the current legal framework in Ecuador. They have to comply with a specific actions to address or to improve the rights of LGBTIQ plus populations. Um, our plan will have four areas of action. The first area has to do with the prevention of violence and discrimination. Within this area, we have a specific action such as the design and implementation of protocols and manuals focused on eradicating gender violence and against LGBTI plus population, also including gender variables in institutional administrative records and files. This is something historical for the country because most of the institutions have committed to including gender variables and sexual orientation variables in their administrative records in order to make visible access uh, to attention services for LGBTI plus persons. The second area has to do with the guarantee to the right to inclusive uh, goods and services. So we are going to have permanent training to uh, staff members who provide first line attention to LGBTI persons in different public services. We also will guarantee access to support lines and we will be designing a national strategy to provide support to LGBTI older persons in the public system. The third area of this diversity plan has to do with the actions uh, that should be conducted by the judiciary institutions uh, that have to do with accountability and the promotion of restitution of rights. This includes reporting cases of violation of the rights of LGBTI plus population, also to conduct communicational campaigns aimed at preventing violence and discrimination against LGBTI plus persons, and also to create a single record of violence that includes gender and sexual orientation variables. In order to identify 
uh, the crimes committed against LGBTI plus persons. This is a way to translate this into public policies focused on prevention. Also, the fourth area has to do with the strengthening of institutional capacities. And most institutions have committed to conducting training uh, for public officials so that they can provide a specialized attention to LGBTI plus persons. It's important to mention all this progress. This is the first public policy tool that is created at the level of the executive branch. And here we have the specific actions that will be conducted by 28 units within the state in order to provide a timely and immediate response in order to guarantee equal access to rights for LGBTI plus persons. In this regard, the second phase of the plan includes a line of action that we are working within the Under Secretariat of Diversity that has to do with updating statistics, taking into consideration the recommendations of several international organizations, including the commission. It's important to have updated data on the situation and the living conditions of LGBTI plus persons. Um, taking into consideration our area of expertise, we have participated in this face together with civil society organizations. And here, what we want is for the population census to include ori sexual orientation and gender diversity variables in 2022. Also, we will have a housing census at the end of this year, and we want these or sexual orientation and gender diversity variables to be included. And we will have also a prison census, and these uh, variables will be included in the census. We will have, therefore, official data and official statistics. And these census are conducted by specific institutions within the state, and we will have official data in Ecuador. In order to supplement the execution of these two statistic instruments, that is the census, uh, the Secretariat is promoting together with the National Institute of Statistics and Census, the um, execution of a survey on the conditions of living of LGBTI plus persons. The goal of the survey is to obtain statistics on the population. And this is the first time that this survey will be conducted in our country. And we only had a case study in 2013, as I mentioned before, but the sample only included 2,800 people. So now we are trying to improve the methodology. And this survey will include a statistics regarding the whole LGBTI population. And also, we hope to execute this survey this year. With regard to the alleged violation of the rights of trans and intersex children, I agree with what civil society organizations have said. The Constitutional Court, in its competence of selecting rulings in order to create binding jurisprudence, selected the Amanda case, um, even though the Constitutional Court has not uh, created binding jurisprudence, we know that the ruling of this case is an important um, moment for the protection of the rights of children regarding their right to identity. And on behalf of the Secretariat of Human Rights, we will be paying attention. We hope that uh, the ruling of the Constitutional Court is implemented. Also, we need to discuss transphobic violence within the at schools. And this was one of the areas mentioned by civil society organizations. The Minister of Education of the State of Ecuador has a specific instrument that is the guide on technical guidelines to prevent and fight 
discrimination based on diversity and gender identity in the national educational system. And I would like to talk about the specific actions to which the Minister of Education has committed. The Minister, the, the Ministry of Education will be training um, a student departments on uh, guidelines to prevent and fight discrimination based on sexual diversity and gender identity in the education system. It will also strengthen the capacities of teachers in the application of these guidelines. It will have also its own record of cases of violence in order to identify the reasons for violence and discrimination. And also it will develop a national strategy to eradicate sexual violence in classrooms together with the relevant institutions, including the Secretariat of Human Rights. Regarding affiliation and the barriers to record children of couples of the same sex, uh, which are uh, born because of assisted reproduction methods, uh, taking into consideration the ruling of the Satya case, the process of record of affiliation of homoparental couples um, is conducted or exists for children uh, born out of two mothers. And also we have a constitutional standard in Article 11.2 in order to prevent discrimination facts to, uh, from occurring again. And there is a record procedure that is included in the norms and regulations of the Office of Vital Records. So there is a procedure and that information was provided by the Office of Vital Records. Also the Office of Vital Records showed us information regarding the number of records of um, um, by couples of same sex couples. In 2019, we have six records of uh, children. In 2020, six records. In 2021, we have six records. And in 2022, we have seven records. Because, the, and these are the years that we have available information because it, as of them, they had to provide that information regarding the bill to reform the organic law on civil data and identity management um, in June, uh, the Secretary of Human Rights was invited to provide technical information on the discussion process to reform uh, the above mentioned law. And we are going to provide information based on the rulings issued by the Constitutional Court and also recommendation by experts and international organizations. Um, our opinion was requested and is a precedent in that discussion for the bill. Also, the inclusion of double filiation for same-sex couples has been included. Also, the change of sex for trans persons should be included, and also uh, the requirements requested to same-sex couples should be made simpler in order to avoid the violation of their rights. And that's why there is a bill to reform this organic law on civil data and identity management. The Secretariat of Human Rights is monitoring the processes occurring in the legislative power in order to promote reforms that promote the rights of LGBTI plus persons. Regarding homoparental or same-sex adoption, as uh, some members of civil society organizations mentioned, there are so far no bills to reform the current legislation. The Article 68 of the Constitution in its last item establishes that adoption should be only for different sex couples. And there is no bill to reform that law. The state, here are some conclusions. The state of Ecuador 
through its Secretariat of Human Rights, and it's recently created under Secretariat of Diversity, are trying to follow and to implement the several recommendations to protect the rights of LGBTI plus persons. We have a document, for example, advances and challenges towards the recognition of the rights of LGBTI persons in the Americas, a report by the Inter-American Commission. This is one of the guidelines that we are using so far. And we are respectful towards independence of the different areas of the state. In a democracy, the Secretariat of Human Rights will continue to monitor the implementation of the rulings within our legal framework and will continue to monitor international standards and human rights that have a direct impact on equal access to the rights of LGBTI persons. As Secretary of Human Rights, we try to follow up on the actions of the state entities so that they adapt their regulations to international standards. Thank you so much. Sorry for interrupting you. Um, but we are running out of time, so I ask you to conclude. Thank you so much. I'm sorry, but due to the presentation, I couldn't see the clock, so uh, thank you. I, I, I'm sorry the clock was blocked to me, but, but I was about to, to end just to uh, demand the, exec the executioner, the executive branch to address this issue. Very well, thank you. We will go now to a different part of the hearing, which is the intervention by the Inter-American Commission. In this case, as country reporter, I will do a brief intervention and then we will uh, continue with our colleague commissioners and our second vice president. I would like to begin by um, commenting that these thematic hearings are done in the framework of the period of session it's in order to make visible certain aspects to uh, get a human rights approach and the function of this visibilization is to be able to identify some obstacles some failures or some aspects that could be improved I would like to thank the interventions uh, for today by both petitioners and the state representatives. In fact, this last uh, presentation by the state is quite uh, complete on a series of actions that you have uh, implemented. And in fact, you can send it uh, to the commission. I would like to begin by asking a question both for the petitioners and the state representatives so that when you have the time to reply, you can provide an answer. Uh, there have been some constitutional obstacles that have been observed. There is in Article 68, there was a conflict with regard to adoption. So my question is if there are other constitutional obstacles as that regulation itself. So to have a clearer idea of the fact if um, the problem is that regulation itself or if there are other regulations that create an obstacle. Of course, there are some pending issues, a pending resolution, but I would like to understand that part. And the other thing has to do with administrative obstacles, obstacles that have created delays or the impossibility of uh, doing some registration uh, bureaucracy. Is this due to an ambiguous regulation, a lack of regulation, or if there is a lack of the application of already existent regulations? There have been some decrees and some reforms uh, issued. So I don't know if the problem is a result of the lack of a correct application of these regulations or if there is still some obstacles in terms of legal reforms pending. So those would be my two questions so that both the petitioners and the state could reply. 
Now I will give first the floor to the Rapporteur for Children and Adolescents, Commissioner Arrasamanda, Esmeralda Arrasamena de Tretinio, so that she can make her comments. Thank you very much, Commissioner Estuardo, Vice President and uh, Chair of this hearing. My respectful greetings and warm greetings for the persons that have provided their testimony today as regards their reality, their life, their situation. Thank you for your trust in the Inter-American Commission. Also, I acknowledge the uh, organizations that have uh, participated in this hearing for their work and their commitment. And also, I acknowledge the representation representatives of the Equatorian state, which come today with a, a landscape of, of uh, recognizing diversity as what it is, a human right, a right to equality, a right to identity, to non-discrimination. I think this is a very important starting point. In addition, I also believe that there is an element that as Inter-American Commission on Human Rights, uh, well, the, the hearings have this target to, to serve as a bridge for communication. And in both, uh, both parties, the state and the civil society have made that call to look, to seek, solutions and communication together to be able to participate in a process that we all know that it's not a very simple process all throughout the continent. So along those lines, for the rapporteurship on the rights of children in the continent to be able to address this issue, on top of it being necessary, it's very valuable. And why is this? Because I I don't know if it was Karen, the first uh, one who said this, but she said that this is an adult-centric approach that does not allow us to see the situation of the rights of children. So if the ch children in general face these obstacles, now for children that are diverse, it's much harder. In this opportunity, we were able to hear us, the specific situation of trans and intersex children. And this is a right, the right to their identity, their right to identi identify themselves as they self-perceive. And I congratulate the parents of Amada because this is a way of getting that recognition, of acknowledging the dignity of their daughter, of what she is really. So I have to acknowledge this, and I would also have to ask a question, a question for the state, and also what's the position on the civil society on this issue? The uh, regulatory changes. There is a set of regulations that already are useful for uh, regulating all the problems, all the issues that the parents of Amanda have told us. There is regulation. So why isn't there an answer for that problem? Taking into account that the whole regulation that we have been told about is existent. This on the one hand. And on the other hand, the regulatory changes and reforms and amendments and what is happening at the parliament or at the assembly or how you call it in, in Ecuador, there is a proposal to reform the law on children and adolescents, specifically from our rapporteurship we would like to know if this amendment to this specific law is taking into consideration this policy, a policy 
of having a, an under secretariat of human rights on diversity to, to me that is a great achievement so i would like to know if you have this approach if, if there is this approach this consideration at the moment of addressing this amendment regarding children and adolescents and so that this issue may be addressed so that would be all com commissioner thank you madam commissioner now i give the floor to our rapporteur for lgbtiq persons commissioner roberta clark thank you very much uh, commissioner alon and i join in greetings to everyone who's participating in this hearing to the lgbti uh, non-governmental organizations um to the the family of Amada, um, and of course, to the representatives of the Ecuadorian state. It, it has been a very useful um, elaboration of the issues. Uh, and there is, you'd, I think, very clear signs of, uh, or indications of progress, but of course that progress is not coming um, at the speed that it must, um, it seems to me, or with the, um, the, the certainty uh, to secure rights in the shortest period of time. I want to recognize um, that the, the civil society organizations, they have pointed to sort of three really discrete rights that of course all joined up in the context of this, of, of, the, of, of our lives and the context of this hearing, the right to equality and non-discrimination, the right to family life and the right to privacy. Um, and it does seem to me that within the context of the of this of the state architecture of Ecuador, that the advisory opinion, uh, the, the the court's advisory opinion, twenty fourth, twenty seventeen, has been accepted as by as binding. I, I understand the constitutional court has so ruled, and it has also given some direction to the National Assembly to reform laws so that trans persons may have access to their rights. Um, but we are hearing that the, these rights have not been secured as yet. I want to thank the representative of the state for outlining what is the one of the plans of the state. You do seem to have a rather comprehensive plan of action, plan of action around diversity to be realized in a, in a time bound period by 2025. Um, and that, that, that plan of action centers the prevention of violence and discrimination. Uh, I think uh, in relation to prevention, uh, you know, I would like to hear a little bit more about what, are the what does the public policy say about transforming institutional culture as well as a, a cultural level of lived experiences to eradicate um, discrimination and to ensure non-discriminatory treatment of all peoples. When you think of when you are, when you are responding to that um, representative states, what does it mean this prevention of, of violence and discrimination? And I also want to recognize the the support of the parents of Amada for championing her her right her, her non negotiable right to a life of dignity, and to see and to join Commissioner um, Esmeralda when she reflects that in relation to a child. Things have to happen more quickly because children, their whole lives are being formed, and uh, and and they and they're experiencing if they experience discrimination and violence and harassment that scars all of us. We know that scars us for life, and so I think when we are thinking about children, there is an obligation to move as swiftly as possible to recognize the rights and to um, ensure that public policy and public action and programs align with the constitutional standards and, of course, with the regional and international obligations of the state. So I just want to ask two questions. I note um, that the, whilst there's, there's there, there are plans to address, um, to bring the laws into conformity with the advisory opinion and the constitutional court's ruling, in relation to adoption, there seem to be no plans. And I want to ask the representative of the state about that. Why are there no plans around adoption and what and has the question of adoption been included in your plan of action related to diversity? Thank you very much. Muchas gracias, Commissioner. 
Le doy la palabra a nuestra segunda. Thank you very much, Madam Commissioner. Now I give the floor to our second Vice President, Commissioner Margaret Mac McCauley. Um, good afternoon. Thank you, um, Mr. First Vice President. Um, I give, say, bid you all good afternoon. And I, I wouldn't refer to you individually. I just thank all of you who are here in this very important issue. And to thank all those who participated, told their stories and ex experiences in order to enhance the content of this, this hearing. Um, which, as has been said, is very vital. And we've all discussed the rights. We know the rights that the children are entitled to. I must say up front that I am really here as the rapporteur for Afro-descendants and against discrimination. And so therefore, I am, must voice my disappointment in not hearing anything mentioned about Afro-descendant children and indigenous persons' children. They are all in the mix and they're all affected and they all need their rights in, uh, to identity uh, and, 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 and gender identity recognized as all other children. And so therefore in 2022, no plan should be made by government without including them. It has to be inclusive to prevent, to encourage diversity, as, as has been said by the state representatives uh, uh, for sexual identity and gender identity, but also to ensure that there is no racial discrimination, or exclusion or invisibility of these two groups of people who are always invisibilized and always ignored and therefore suffered the worst and are most vulnerable. Um, they are also, as I say, entitled to attention. But I do have certain questions for both the state and civil society. And this relates to, have there been psychological studies done by experts on the effect on the mental and emotional states of children who are within the LGBI community in their development and how it affects their development, how it furthers the fragmentation when this extends too long of their personality and their being. Has, is the government acting on expert evidence in making policies and plans and not changing laws to give them protection? And has civil society also acquired and gotten expert opinions to use in your lobbying with governments to ensure that they make the most effective and realistic and humane plans, policies, uh, to move the agenda forward, but most importantly, to ensure that the state makes its constitutional changes which are absolutely necessary to guarantee, policies do not guarantee anything, but the constitutional provisions do. And so I ask both sides, are you acting through experience that you had and and, and beliefs rather than based on expert opinions of psychologists in this subject matter. Because as has been said, these are children developing, they're entitled to develop properly in their true selves. So that is my question. And please always remember the racial discrimination aspect that is ongoing at all times. Thank you. Muchas gracias, Commissioner. Tenemos Thank you, Commissioner. We have some additional minutes, so I would like to give the floor to the special rapporteur, Soledad Garcia Muñoz. Thank you, Commissioner, rapporteur, and chair of this hearing. 
It's a pleasure. Thank you, everyone, for all the information. I have a comment and a question. The comment has to do with the importance of taking into consideration the standards promoted by the Commission uh, in terms of economic, social, cultural, and environmental rights um, that are related to the aspects covered in this hearing. Together with the rapporteurship of LGBTI persons, we did a report on the situation of ESCERs of LGBTI plus persons. And it's important that the state takes into consideration that report. And also the San Salvador Working Group has made recommendations to the state of Ecuador in order to promote the lives of LGBTI persons. And the state mentioned that they are about to conduct a survey on the living conditions of LGBTI persons. And I think that the report and the document on how to measure gaps uh, could be very useful. And my question has to do with the challenges that you are facing um, both civil society and state in terms of the right to health of LGBTI children in Ecuador. I am concerned about uh, the pathologization of LGBTI persons. Um, we know that there are treatments to treat LGBTI persons as they had a mental disease. So we would like to know the challenges that you are facing regarding the right to health. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you, Rapporteur. So now we would like to give the floor back to civil society for 12 minutes. You have 12 minutes to react and to share with us your perspectives. Good afternoon. My name is Christian Paula. I'm president of Pacta Foundation. I would like to talk about the LGBTI public policy. The state of Ecuador since 2015, after government agreement 21, five, two, five uh, committed itself to working on an LGBTI public policy. The final draft was ready at the beginning of 2017. In 2017, no measures were taken. In June 2018, the president at the time said that she would approve that public policy towards the end of uh, her mandate. In 2021, the Secretariat of Human Rights is created. However, the proposal is limited to the rights uh, that were covered in the proposal of 2015. In addition, it's important to mention that data on LGBTI persons are from 2013. So we have had no data for nine years. And also family rights, equal property, trans boys and girls, all these initiatives have been because of litigation and not because of public policies promoted by the state. The executive branch and the state have competences to advance on these issues, as in many other fields. But in order uh, to, uh, when it comes to LGBTI rights, they are not observing them. And we also need to promote intersectionality on public policies on children, LGBTI children, and same sex couples. This is one of the recommendations received by the state of Ecuador, but so far these recommendations are not being applied. Most of these matters are brought to justice because the executive and the legislative branches are not promoting the reforms of the regulations. With regard to same-sex filiation, the state of Ecuador in their intervention and several times in the past has not acted on the need to create protocols that recognize double filiation. And therefore many families are left outside and they cannot protect their children. 
The Secretary of Human Rights that belongs to the executive branch has not promoted any action to change uh, the legal framework regarding any of the matters presented in this hearing and is not following up on the actions implemented by the legislative power in this matter. Also, we need to say that only some matters, those who can pay for the assisted reproduction produce procedures in private clinics, those are the only ones that can access the proceedings to adopt children. Um, but for example, Elena Denise, who did it with um, other procedures, they have no access to adoption. And the same happens to men same-sex marriages. They don't have access to filiation. So we see also that the provisions are contrary to rights and they are contrary to their rights to equality and non-discrimination and to the right to a family. The Secretariat should review the protocols and should make sure that the protocols uh, are compliant with the SATIA ruling. We need also internal institutional change. Commissioners, I would like to address some of the questions you mentioned regarding adoption. The Ecuadorian constitution is uh, promoting several rights, the right to equality, and also considers that sexual orientation and gender identity are cat uh, protected categories most of the constitutional text is not a problem. The problem has to do with Article 68 that I mentioned. It contradicts all the other rights enshrined in the Constitution. The other issue that we have is that since the provision of adoption is established in Constitution, um, to eliminate this article, it's very difficult. And therefore, uh, it's difficult to consider unconstitutional the constitution. And as uh, other, my colleagues were saying, many of the struggles to win LGBTI rights is that this cannot be done because this cannot be done through a strategic litigation. So the only possibility is to reform the constitution. But in order to reform the constitution, we need majorities in the National Assembly. And since this is a controversial matter, this won't be resolved through majority mechanisms. So the commitment of the state must be huge in order to create a body in order to be able to eliminate this provision in the constitution. There is a constitutional barrier Currently, the Code on Children and Adolescents that is effective ratifies the constitutional provision and prohibits same-sex marriage adoption. And taking into consideration what Commissioner Arosemena was saying, the other codes just repeat the provisions. They cannot do any, any, any more. The problem is constitutional. I feel really sad because the state of Ecuador has not indicated their plan regarding this provision that violates the rights of LGBTI persons and of children in Ecuador. This is not a state that defends the rights of LGBTI persons because there is a discussion and there is a provision that violates human rights. I would like to say that there are several things that the state omitted today. The reasons that lie behind this constitutional provision have to do with the bias. It is uh, because they don't believe that same-sex marriages will be good parents. That is what they are questioning. But that argument was um, challenged by several rulings, for example, in Chile. Uh, regard and regarding May uh, Margaret May Macaulay's question, we have collected several information regarding psychological aspects and we have a, there is no negative impact on children raised by lgbti couples there is no ruling or no information so that argument is challenged and another argument used by the state is that they keep this provision this constitutional provision 
to avoid discrimination against children because of the sexual orientation of their parents. But that argument should be challenged because the state should guarantee the rights of all persons regarding the situations of discrimination that can occur in society. The, in fact, this issue of adoption is a regional issue. There are only seven countries in the region that allow for same-sex uh, adoption. So that's why we request your help in this matter. Thank you so much. Sorry, we would like to uh, continue talking on behalf of trans free children. The reporter were asking about trans children. In civil society, we have private support groups because of the lack of support by the state of Ecuador to guarantee the mental health of our children. It's important to take into consideration that AMADA had access to psychological support, even abroad, because we are in a privileged situation. We have had the economic means to do that. But what happened with those people that do not have the economic resources, the state under its current health system doesn't have a plan that covers the mental health of children. Civil society, parents and psychologists have created a network to bring specialists to Ecuador to train doctors. And we have brought doctors from Argentina and we are paying for that. The state of Ecuador has not contributed any economic or financial resource in order and the state has not um, allocated any budget for this. There is a guide on diversity, but that guide took two years and the guide was sent by email to the Ministry of Education while they send hundreds of emails every day. So they are not taking this seriously. The Office of Vital Records appealed in order to uh, deny the right to identity of my daughter in spite of the fact they have information of other trans children who have requested the change of their name. They know the impact that Amada will suffer. Amada has been a very popular girl. She has made several statements and she has told everyone that her right to education has been endangered. But our children, uh, there are children that do not have the same rights as Amada. We don't have figures regarding indigenous children or Afro-descendant children. In some provinces, there is no information even about, they don't even receive the guidelines and we don't have any information and the state has allocated no budget for that. So that's, for example, uh, what the Office of Vital Records did was terrible. And that was because of the approval of the state, because they knew, because if they did not follow the advisory opinion, uh, the, oh, the whole issue will take years. Amada cannot go back to the country. They are damaging me because I'm abroad. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much. I would like to thank you for using your time wisely. I would like to give the floor to the state. The state took two extra minutes in its first intervention, so you will have now 10 minutes to intervene. You have the floor. Thank you so much. Once again, the Secretariat of Human Rights as representatives of the state of Ecuador would like to thank this space of dialogue created by the Inter-American Commission of Human Rights. 
because this space helps makes uh, the needs of LGBTI persons visible, especially it's important to join efforts. However, it's important to mention, as several commissioners have pointed out, the important progress made so far by the state of Ecuador in terms of the rights of the LGBTI plus population. The creation of this administrative unit to address the rights and the issues of LGBTIQ plus persons within the executive branch is an integral reparation conducted by the state of Ecuador, taking into consideration the needs of the LGBTI population as such. However, our competence is limited within the executive branch. However, we are conducting coordinated work with different areas of the state. For example, uh, in the diversity action plan, because of institutional will, institutions from other areas of the state uh, are participating. This includes, for example, institutions from the judiciary. Um, in this regard, there is um we identify that there is a lack of regulations uh and we know that the legislative power has its own processes and we know that there are different rulings of the constitutional court and there are there has been two reforms of the bill to reform the current organic law on civil data and identity management in our country, uh, our secretariat has provided its technical expertise after the visit of the commission. And now we are having a second discussion to reform the organic code on children and adolescents. When the secretariat of human rights is invited to participate, we will be making our contributions to try to guarantee the rights of children and LGBTI plus families included in those reforms. I would like to say that within the health area, the diversity action plan, uh, the Ministry of Health of Ecuador is going to disseminate or is going to have a manual on best practices to address the health of LGBTI plus persons. I want to mention this here, and this diversity action plan uh, is for a period of time. It has some targets and goals, and we are going to monitor and follow. And this will be done by the Secretariat of Diversities and by other entities of the state who can do so. This includes the National Council on Gender Equality and also civil society organizations can monitor this plan and its implementation. We want to guarantee the proper execution of the plan by the 28 institutions who will be conducting actions as part of the plan. It's also important to mention that we are a recent administrative unit who is working in different lines of action. Um, and regarding the contributions in the judiciary to guarantee the implementation of the rules of the Constitutional Court, we have a bilateral table with the Office of Vital Records and we should respect the independence of the different entities of the state and we provide technical assistance to guarantee the implementation of these rulings. For example, the case of Rafaela, the ruling was issued in December last year. The ruling recognized our um, handmade reproduction procedures as um, assisted reproduction procedures. And as a result, they have been able to record 
um, Rafaela with double filiation. And we are doing this uh, by, uh, through our work in connection with the Office of Vital Records. We are also working with experts regarding the implementation of rulings um, that should be followed by the Office of the Vital Records. Of, um, and we would like to reiterate our commitment to working in coordination with civil society organizations in order to guarantee the different rights of the LGBTI population. In addition, in order to conclude, it's important to mention that um, in this diversity action plan, we are including the constitutional principles that establish that discrimination should not be based on racial aspects or ethnic aspects. And we are trying to promote the participation of civil society organizations from different regions of the country. Uh, for example, we have civil society organizations from Puerto Vejo, and also we have also organizations from the city of Quito and organizations from the north and from the Amazon area of the country as well. And the diversity action plan includes a specific actions uh, in order to guarantee the equality of peoples and nationalities. And we are trying to implement a transversal approach in this plan. And therefore, the five councils that are competent according to con the constitution to make expert recommendations, they are included. We have the Gender Equality Council, we have the uh, Council for Persons Living with Disabilities, and we want to have a transversal perspective based on a human rights approach. Uh, this is for the specific actions included in this plan. This is what I can mention uh, on behalf of the state. What we want is to make the articulate work that we are doing from different entities within the state visible. We would like to thank you for this space and we would like to reiterate to civil society organizations that we want to work together with you. We have done so in the tables to create the diversity action plan. Our doors are always open for any technical contribution that you want to make in this matter. Very well, thank you very much. I think uh, the state's intervention has concluded. So now I have a message from Commissioner Mar Margaret May McCauley. I think she forgot uh, an idea or a, or a question she wanted to make. So before concluding this hearing, I would like to give the floor to her. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. President. I was hoping you would do it for me, but it is as quickly as possible. It is that I one person mentioned that a thematic report to be prepared by the commission. I think that's a brilliant idea because we do need such a report, which will be very comprehensive and regional and cover as many states, if not all as possible in the region, given success stories, challenges, referring to laws which have worked and those which have not, which I think we need this. And then perhaps based on that report, we may find the need for the commission to have a rapporteurship specifically for, for, for this group of children who are being so discriminated, discriminated against all around the region. Thank you. Thank you very much, Commissioner. We're about to conclude the hearing, but I'm sorry, Commissioner Clark, go ahead. I'm, I'm sorry to prolong the hearing. I just want to say that we have heard the request made for a report on the status of LGBTI um, children and their families, a regional report. And this request has also come from other uh, countries 
to the rapporteurship and we will we do have it under active consideration and look forward to further exchanges with you as we firm up what the content of the report will be and our methodology. Muy bien. Muchas gracias, Commissioner. Very well. Thank you very much, Madam Commissioner. When the state intervened, they were lacking one minute. This, and I see the ambassador who wants the floor, so I give him the floor for one minute. Thank you, Commissioner. Well, I only wanted to thank and also reiterate the uh, availability on the part of the state of Ecuador to dialogue and to to exchange information with the commission on this issue and all other issues that have to do with the inter-American system of human rights and all the instruments that pertain to our region. So that, will, that was my comment. I wanted to thank all commissioners and the representatives of the civil society that have participated at, uh, in this hearing this afternoon. Thank you. Very well, thank you very much. We are concluding with this hearing and now I would like to also thank all representatives and petitioners at this hearing, representatives of the civil society first and foremost, because at this thematic hearing you were able to share with us the different uh, sides, the different obstacles and situations that are affecting human rights as regards this issue. I wanted to also thank the explanation given by the state in terms of the progression they have had and also their openness to the, the willingness to engage in a dialogue. As a commission, we will monitor your work on this issue very closely. Uh, me, as being rapporteur for Ecuador, I will be uh, very looking very closely to the advancement on this issue. You can always communicate uh, with us. We have the rapporteur for LGBTIQ persons here as well, Commissioner Klaus. So with her, we'll be working in coordination for whatever you may need on these issues. I wanted to thank you and thank my colleagues and I uh, adjourn this meeting. Thank you. Muchas gracias. Un saludo. Thank you very much. Thank you.